Dylan, are you wanting to go over our next badass of history? Mm hmm. So what I wish to talk about uh, from uh, is a woman named Margaret Hamilton. So we got another woman that's living in a time where, you know, women don't exactly have a lot of say in a lot of um, autonomy um, back in her um, time period. But because of her but because of the talents that she has and because of her knowledge, it that 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 society, that kind of societal oppression just couldn't stop her. So. Um, on July 20th, 1969, a, a lunar module, Eagle, was approaching the moon's surface. Its computers began flashing warning messages. For a moment, Mission Control forced a go-no-go -no -go decision, but with high confidence in the software-developed computer scientist Margaret Hamilton and her team, they told astronauts to proceed. The software, which allowed the computer to recognize error messages and, and ignore low-priority tasks, continued to guide the astronauts Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin over the crater pock, dusty crust, of the moon to their landing. It became quite clear, she later said, that the software was not only informing everyone that there was a hardware-related problem, but the software was compensating for it. An investigation would eventually show that the astronauts' checklist was at fault, telling them to set the rendezvous radar hardware switch incorrectly. Fortunately, the people at a mission control at mission control trusted our software, end quote, Hamilton said. And only enough fuel for 30 more seconds of flight, Neil Armstrong reported, the Eagle has landed. The achievement was a monumental task at, the, at a time when computer technology was in its infancy. The astronauts had access to only 72 kilobytes of computer memory. A 64 gigabyte cell phone today carries almost a million times more storage space. Yeah, don't ever underestimate the power of, of today's cell phones. They're right. they're they're Superman compared to these computers. Exactly. Progr yep. Programmers had to use paper punch cards to feed information into room-sized computers with no interface. As the landing occurred, Hamilton then at 30, age 32, was hooked up to mission control from MIT. I was not concentrating on the mission per se, Hamilton confessed. I was concentrating on the software. After everything worked properly, the weight of the, the, weight of the moment hit her. My God, look what happened. We did it. it. It worked. It was exciting. Hamilton, who popularized the term software engineering, took, took chitting for it. Critics said that it inflated her work important, but today, when software engineers represent a, a fervently sought-after segment of the workforce, no one is laughing at Margaret Hamilton. Exactly. So here's a little uh, picture here. Yeah, um, I'm going to pull that up here for you. Yeah, if you could do that, please. So this was yep. the printout of everything that was going on there. I don't know that we're necessarily supposed to understand that, but um, yeah. that's how it looks like sure, there. So let's see, state vector. That's got to be just navigation type uh, calculations there. Some of them, uh, it's kind of difficult to uh, discern based on what they named the variables what each one of those are, but uh, I imagine it's calculus, and they're trying to move the uh, spacecraft in a in such a way so as to put it on the correct trajectory of where it's going. Looks like time variable, RSS, RX. They're doing vectors there, it looks like. Looks like it has a printout of what its current position is. See, I see Apogee is uh, something that I've seen in Kerbal Space Program. <laughs> Peregree is, uh, yeah, another angle. They've got azimuth elevation range. So, yeah, the all of these were studied. Um, and, of course, it's put into the, into the uh, computer, but they had all of these printouts, and that's how they had to determine or, you know, what they use to determine if the program was working correctly. Pretty neat. Oof. I don't know how I can comp comprehend any of that. So, all right. Anyways, 
when the Apollo missions were planned, the process uh, the process of writing code began on large sheets of paper. I'll be right a back. Key punch a key punch operator would create holes in paper cards, keying the code into what were called punch cards. Not too many people know what punch cards are anymore, but that's how you programmed it, says Paul Cerucci, a curator of the Emeritus in the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum, who has known Hamilton for the past two decades. The museum holds in its collection the Apollo Flight Guidance Computer Software Collection created by Hamilton herself. The archival material includes printout sheets known as the listings, which shows results of guidance equation calculations when the computer's output identified no problems, software engineers would quote unquote eyeball the listings, verifying that no issues required attention. Once everything looked up to snuff, the code was sent to a Raytheon factory where mostly women, many of them former employees of New England textile mills, wove copper wires and magnetic cores into a long rope of wire. With coding written on in ones and zeros, the wire went through the tiny magnetic core when it represented a one, and when it ran around the core when it represented a zero. This ingenious process created a rope that carried software instructions. The women who did the work were known as <laughs> LOL, Hamilton told Caruzzi, not because they were funny, <laughs> it was short for little old ladies. Hamilton was called Rope Mother. <laughs> Here's another picture of her over in the, uh, I'm assuming, the simulation cockpit. Wow. Just wow. <laughs> Man. The role compensated for the Apollo's computer's limited memory. The process created a, quote-unquote, a very robust system, according to Tizo Mio Harmony, a curator at the Air and Space Museum and author of a new book of the new book, Apollo to the Moon, a history in, in 50 objects. That was once one of the single reasons why Apollo Guidance Computer worked flawlessly throughout every single mission. A math lover from, from an early age, Hamilton transformed that affinity, becoming an expert software, writing and engineering following her departure from college. When her husband was attending law school at, in Har at Harvard in 1959, she took a job at MIT, learning to write software that could predict the weather. A year later, she began programming systems to locate enemy aircraft in the semi-automatic ground environment, or SAGE, program. It was in the mid-1960s that Hamilton heard that MIT had, quote, had announced that they were looking for people to do programming to send man to the moon. And I just thought, wow, I got I got to go there, end quote. Obviously. She had, <laughs> yeah, right? She had planned to begin graduate, to graduate school and Brandeis University for a degree in abstract math, but the U.S. space program won her heart. Thanks to the success of her work at SAGE, her, uh, she was the first programmer hired at the Apollo Project at MIT. In 1965, she became head of her own team at the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory, later known as Draper Laboratory which was dedicated to writing and testing software for Apollo 11's two 70-pound computers, one abroad, the command module, Columbia, and one abroad in the lunar module, Eagle. And that's her getting a medal from former President Barack Obama. Yeah, yeah, and for I those who are not... Yeah, I was going to say uh, I no, can continue right. on the rest of it here, but uh, go ahead. Um, and for those of you who don't exactly um, understand why computer, like why, um, why, like it's, like why our technology today seems to be um, smaller, but yet they seem to be more expensive. It's actually, I learned this in math um, during my undergrad years from a, from a, um, my, my algebra teacher who was also an engineer. And I think he was, he was a military guy. I know he was, I can't remember what branch though, uh, but he was an engineer. Uh, absolutely. He was, uh, he was uh, absolutely amazing to learn from. Very, very good at math. He was a martial artist too. And me and him clicked because I, I myself was a martial artist back in my, high school and middle school days and um 
and he's and and that's where I learned that computers when they were first you know like it's where we're in its infancy the computers used to be gigantic they were heavy they were massive oh, yeah. and and they and it took so much material to make and that's the reason why um now actually compared to if you compare today's technology like this phone right here or the computer that I'm doing this stream on right now is actually a lot less expensive than the computers back in that in that era because this requires less tech less material to make and not to mention and the why it takes less material for, to make is because of her because like she said the software is is compensating the software is doing the work and not to mention a lot of times software is so advanced today that if there should be a, a bug a glitch or any sort of anything that would make that would make your your device act you know not right a lot of times it can fix itself or by doing certain commands it can also be repaired like that sure. and yeah and and like i said and the and like i said before those computers were huge as hell but they are nowhere as powerful as a smartphone. Oh, yeah. These, yeah, these, yeah, these little guys are su are like Superman times fifty compared to those big giganto computers back in the sixties and seventies. Well, yeah. So, like in the in the old days when they were, uh, so as many people probably know, you know, computers work off of ones and zeros. So. What they were using in those old days were often vacuum tubes, these gigantic, I mean, they weren't gigantic, but by today's standards, they absolutely are uh, gigantic yes. in comparison. And that the only purpose of those vacuum tubes was to either represent a one or if it was off a zero and the, uh, you know, advancements that we see today and, you know, the large difference in size is really because of our uh, engineering feats of creating smaller and smaller transistors and being able to pack more transistors into a smaller space. So uh, yeah, it's all obviously driven, you know, software has uh, greatly improved over the years but you know the hardware side has also greatly improved uh to help along well, that software as well oh, well yeah and isn't isn't software starting to become is starting to have more like adapt adapt um adaptive abilities and like artificial intelligence now because i mean i know we're starting to make i know there's like i know it's still in proto don't get me wrong um i mean this isn't this isn't star wars or anything i know this but <laughs> But like I know, like we're in experimentation of creating art AI or artificial intelligence or adaptive AI. Like, is that's pretty much where software is at now? So, isn't it? Sh so Shulibi Snack. Uh, it's too bad he's not on today, but uh, he would have quite a bit of an opinion on this. We've had uh, a number of conversations. So, when uh, the industry today says AI, it's not really actually like artificial general intelligence the only thing that quote unquote ai is doing today is it's it's got a a better or uh it, it is better at analyzing a large catalog of data than what the human brain is so essentially oh, to okay. us it appears to be like mind-blowing and kind of ai-ish because of what it's doing, you know, like analyzing pictures or recognizing patterns, but it's not sentient in any way. Like it's not, it, it's not like, like I've it's seen a, a recent, program. I've seen a recent article where the, there's like a Google engineer that seems to think that the Google AI is sentient. And I'm sorry, I, I call on that guy full of shit because the only thing that those AI quote unquote are doing, which I don't even like, you know, after having numerous conversations and looking more into it, I wouldn't even call that like an actual AI because when people say AI, they're thinking like a artificial general intelligence, like similar to what a human 
uh, humans intelligence, you know, the, the capability of uh, solving complex problems and that really all, even when you see a quote unquote AI, that's like creating a, uh, a, an image or a 3d image, like based upon like, uh, like if they're saying, what is the optimum, uh, attractive male face? For example, if we're just like throw an example out there, an A mm -hmm. uh, today's I'll get close to my camera so you can see it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Today today's AI, you, in order to do that, you would have to feed it a ton of data of all well, not even all, but like many thousands or even hundreds of thousands or possibly even millions of images of like say male faces. And then you would have to input some sort of a algorithm for it to then analyze it and say what is a good feature versus a bad feature. And then do you see where I'm going with this? Like it's not, yeah. it doesn't have like a, like when I, you know, as a human male who isn't personally attracted to men, right? You can still get an idea of what you think based upon what you've seen throughout your experience in life of what society thinks is an attractive face for a male, mm -hmm. the society yep. you live in, obviously, versus what society thinks is not an attractive face for a male. And really the quote unquote AI is doing kind of the same thing, but it's not doing it because of like its own social, like it doesn't have any way of being social, right? It doesn't have any way of going through high school and noticing that certain guys with a certain type of face get all the ladies or, you know, we'll say versus right. certain guys with a certain other type of face don't get the ladies or a body type or, and we're kind of simplifying this because obviously it's a very complex, all of this is very complex. All it's doing is just taking a shitload of images and then utilizing some sort of a algorithm that it's fed to determine what is the most attractive face. And then from there, like if it's told to recreate something, it would have to be told all of this, like everything it is doing it has to be told to do that so like we're we're not seeing yet today an actual artificial general intelligence where it can exist on its own and and actually solve uh you know complex problems like there's no ai today that could like recreate calculus or something from scratch without being fed a ton of information uh, you know, it's, it's a machine that has a better capability of doing certain tasks but and, it, but requires programs and orders to do so. Right. So it, it is impressive. I'm not saying it's not impressive. It, it absolutely is. I'm just saying that a lot of people are misled because of buzzwords on what a, you know, the buzzword AI in today's terms is actually doing. It's not doing it in the way that like a human would do that by any stretch of the, you know, the, 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 I guess, term it, it can't say, uh, you know, come up with just, you, you can't just like sp spin up an AI program or whatever and that AI easily be able to, for example, um, go over and, okay, so like on my desk here, for example, this is a really tough problem in the uh, world of artificial inte intelligence. So like Boston Dynamics, I bet they can do it. But of course, we're talking literally a decade or more of engineers trying to solve this problem. But like I can look down at this, uh, at my desk and on my desk, there's a spoon sitting there and I can look down there and then I can look up at the camera and then I can go over and reach out and I can grab that spoon without looking at it. And right. AI couldn't do that today. It just, I, I'm just saying like 
without it having to keep an image in its head or whatever in 3D space to go over and like reach out with an arm. Or even if like, say, I didn't know what was to the right of me, I just can feel over here, oh, it's a bottle cap. You know what I mean? Like an AI couldn't do that. It's like a problem. Yeah, I get you. Yeah. And we went on a yeah, tangent I, I there, but it's 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 an yeah, interesting discussion. Think, yeah, I didn't think that AI was that advanced, but I know like but I know like AI exists, but like what we see in sci fi or in our video games that we play, yeah. No, that's yeah, oh I know it's nowhere near that. Because I mean that would take yeah, that would take so much development and so much like software processing power for that to even be anywhere probably even half that powerful yeah and the, and the thing that's the biggest problem is that really an artificial general intelligence takes many different factors that we take for granted as a human brain like uh -huh. search is what google does right Right. So, like, for us, in, like, a concept, search would be, and we have to do it kind of, like, in a physical sense, but, like, let's say there wasn't the internet. Search would be going up, I want to know this knowledge. So then, like, let's say we're in the world without the internet. I, therefore, need to first find what the book is of some expert. Or, like, let's say it doesn't exist. Like, like let's put it even farther back than that how did da vinci you know come up with these various metrics for determining like the light spectrum or uh you know and he was wrong about flight right but he still was trying to devise experiments to try to figure out how flight works or whatever so like that's what i'm saying is we even in science are building upon a body of knowledge and later scientists like the Wright brothers were using kind of like those older experiments from Da Vinci and then further and further. I don't know, like the whole history of flight. I'm sure there was somebody after Da Vinci that figured another thing out. And then somebody after that figured another thing out. And then finally the Wright brothers were the ones that like actually flew for the first time. But I'm just saying and that now we have, and now we have airplanes. <laughs> right. And I'm just saying that, AI most certainly would be like to by today's standards be just given that knowledge so it's got a bit of a leg up but regardless of that fact if it were to be a case that we had just like a Google AI and it's fed nothing it would have no metric or way of like getting to flight right like it would never uh -huh. be able to solve that problem eventually right. we will have the capability i think you know it's it's all an engineering problem just like the human body and age and death is ultimately an engineering problem but once again that's like a, yet another problem that is many you know we're all going to die before that's fixed so i'm just saying like it, it's absolutely impressive and there's some amazing things that like machine learning can do but we're just not quite there but we, we got on a long tangent there, and that's my bad. But uh, it's something that I've looked a lot into, and it's very interesting. Um, I recommend that people check out, uh, like, uh, the Making Sense podcast with uh, Sam Harris. There's at least five or six episodes I can think of from, like, uh, actual, um, you know, engineers that specialize in our industry pioneers in ai that he uh, talks to on there that's uh very interesting conversations but i'm going to continue on with margaret hamilton there because we're still talking about badasses from history and she is one of them isn't that the scene from captain america civil war what is I mean, that I see robert redford there in the background that's not Robert, or this guy? That is Robert Redford. I thought this was Tom Hanks. Is that Tom Hanks there? That's Tom Hanks. That's to say Tom that, Hanks. Yeah, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's Tom Hanks. I was wondering about that as I was speaking about AI there. Welcome back, Mike. What's up? So I've been here for like twenty minutes. <laughs> and so to continue on here, uh, and this is a quote. Quote: What I think about when I think Margaret Hamilton is her quote that quote within a quote. There was no choice but to be pioneers. End quote within a quote because I think that really 
embodies who she was and her significance in this program, Muir Harmony says. She was a pioneer when it came to development of software engineering and a pioneer as a woman in the workplace contributing to this type of program, taking on this type of role. Then, as now, most software engineers were male, but she never let the, that stand in her way. She has this mentality that there should be equal rights and equal access, and it wasn't about men and women. It was about people being able to pursue the kinds of jobs they want to pursue and take on the challenges they want to take on. She was also really expansive as a programmer, coming up with solutions for problems, very innovative, very outside-of-the-box thinking, that I think is reflected in her career, choices, and the work she did in the lab. In a bid to make software more reliable, Hamilton sought to design Apollo software to be capable of dealing with unknown problems and flexible enough to interrupt one task to take on a more important one. In her search for new ways to debug a system, she realized that sound could sense or serve as an error detector. Her program at Sage, she noted, sounded like a seahorse when it was running. Once she was awakened by a colleague who said her program no longer sounded like a seahorse. She rushed in to work, eager to find the problem and to start applying this new form of debugging to her work. So this is a uh, picture of a Lego set. <laughs> that is, I'm sure that's Margaret Hamilton maybe there. I can't quite tell. Looks like it. Yeah, Hamilton. I, I can the barely read that. black guy on the that. other end is Margaret Hamilton. That does not make sense whatsoever. I know. As a working mother, she Just took her young... on your toes. She took her mother... Um, yeah, a Angel Dust. I, I was just mentioning that earlier. There's a Google employee who said Google AI was sentient. I'm sorry. No, it's not. Like, there, we don't even have the technology or the engineering uh, capability to create sentient AI. Like the only thing that the Google AI does is analyze pictures and is capable of looking through data to give you the best search possible. There's no search and analyze are only two aspects of intelligence. You need far more aspects of intelligence to create like a sentient being. Um, but I'm going to continue here on, um, um, you know, this margaret hamilton uh thing here and it looks like lance is going to be up next with uh, a really interesting subject let me uh can, but i can talk i can tell you jason though from experience machines can be possessed because i've seen some very crazy shit happen with my tech that i could not explain and there was a time that my mom's phone just all of a sudden just talked on its own and would not respond to any of my mom's commands and i and it was so bad to the point where i couldn't even fix it that just sounds like tech nowadays, dude. It always fucking up for no reason. Well, I mean, it was so weird because, like, my mom, I guess my mom was driving back home from work one day, and she uh, she came in, and I, I could hear these weird noises. I heard these weird, like, these, like, weird voices. What the fuck is that? That just walked in my house. And my mom's like, Dylan, uh, you're, uh, something's wrong with my phone. I'm like, what's it doing and it kept on talking on its own and like doing shit on its own and i'm just like what the fuck is going on and i tried to tap it and it wouldn't respond to me <laughs> it was so crazy um so i want to one... before we get on a tangent <laughs> i want to like continue this margaret hamilton because we've got we're on right. page 12 of 27 we need to we need to get moving so, as a working mother, she took her young daughter to the MIT Instrumentation Laboratory with her at night and on weekends. One day, her daughter decided to play astronaut and pushed a simulator button that made the system crash. Hamilton realized immediately that the mistake was one that an astronaut could make, so she recommended adjusting the software to address it. But she was told astronauts are trained never to make a mistake. During Apollo 8's mission... Uh, a moon orbiting flight astronaut Jim Lovell made the exact same error that her young daughter had and fortunately Hamilton's team was able to correct the problem within hours for but for all future Apollo flights protection was built into the software to make sure it never happened again over time Hamilton began to view the whole mission as a system part is realized as software part is peopleware and part is hardware 
Hamilton's work guided the remaining Apollo missions that landed on the moon, as well as benefiting Skylab, the first U.S. space station, in the 1970s. Um, L4N night. Oh, I think that was a mistype. In 1972, she left MIT and started her own company, Higher Order Software. 14 years later, she launched another company, Hamilton Technologies, Inc. At her new firm, she created Universal Systems Language, another step in making the process of designing systems more dependable. NASA honored Hamilton with the NASA Exceptional Space Act Award in 2003, acknowledging her contributions to software developing and granting her biggest financial prize that the agency had ever awarded to one person until that time. $37,200. In 2016, as we saw in this uh, picture over here, President Barack Obama awarded her the Medal of Freedom, noting that her example speaks of the American spirit of discovery that exists in every little girl and every little boy who knew that somehow to look behind that somehow to look beyond the heavens is to look deep within ourselves. Hamilton's work may not be widely known to those outside the scientific community, though her achievements have been memorialized, or excuse me, memorialized with the 2017 introduction of the Lego Margaret Hamilton action figure, which we saw here. It portrays Hamilton as a small, big haired, uh, bespectacled hero whose Apollo code stacked up to be taller than she was. The National Air and Space Museum now holds the prototypes for these action figures Software engineers are not generally viewed as courageous action figures, but Hamilton is no stranger to the bravery required for heroism. She remembers being fearless even when the experts say, no, this doesn't make sense. They don't believe it. Nobody did. It was something that we were dreaming of happening, but it became real.